God. Amen. Amen. All right, you guys can be seated. Morning, church. Pretty pumped today. I don't know why. I'm just pumped about this sermon. I'm probably gonna be a little fiery. Is that all right? Yeah, you say that now. I need something to tilt my thing up like this. Yeah, where's my shim at? <laughs> so I want, you to, I want you to stop and think real quick to start off this sermon. First of all, can I just say that I appreciate a strong man. I think Joe's a strong man. And I, there's something like it gives me pride when I sit back and listen to a man being like bold preaching the gospel, bold saying that giving's the right thing to do. I'm just like, yes, inside of me, I'm, yes. In a culture that hates men, I like men. In fact, I think God designed men. And I also love women, I think God designed women. Anyway, sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. So, I want you to stop and think right now what your biggest life battle is. Is it a health issue? Is it strife in some kind of relationship? Is it a financial issue? Is it an issue with an ex-husband or an ex-wife, an ex-spouse? What is your biggest issue right now? I want that in your head. Now, there's something I've been getting into lately. Um, I don't know, so I, read, I actually read, I watched a video on Instagram that said that eventually all men get into this, but I've been kind of nerding out about wars. Anyone ever nerded out about wars before? Like why we got in the wars, World War II, World War I. I don't know why, I'm fascinated. They're very complex, they're very nuanced, there's a lot going on. It's not as simple as like it's a good guy and a bad guy. There's all kinds of background things going on. Well, one of them that I was looking into is World War II. World War II was fascinating because you have the Nazi regime, which if you, if you study that at all, it's super jacked up, right? Um, but one thing the Nazis were known for is they wanted to expand their regime. They wanted to grow. Well, when they were trying to do this, what they thought was the best method was they would attack their biggest threat, which would be the Soviet Union. So the Nazis go after the Soviet Union and the whole world sits back and watches these two superpowers collide. But what they didn't realize was that that was not their true enemy. That behind the scenes there were three other countries colliding into one that would eventually overtake them. They, they were, their, their enemy that they perceived was the wrong enemy. And I see this the same way in us. In your life battle, whatever you thought about what your battle is, a lot of us think of Whatever your enemy you think is your enemy, that's not the real enemy. Would you guys stand as I read this week's scripture? In Zechariah 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 10. It says this, Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel, clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you, and I will clothe you with pure vestments. I said, let them put a clean turban on his head, so, that they, so they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by, and the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have char charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Hear now, O Joshua the high priest, you and your friends who sit before you, for they are men who are assigned. Behold, I will bring my servant the branch. For behold, on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven eyes, I will engrave its inscription, declares the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the iniquity of this land in a single day. In that day, declares the Lord of hosts, every one of you will invite his neighbor to come under his vine and under his fig tree. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for today. That again, we have the opportunity to come in and learn from your word. Father, that we unite around the word and we unite around sacrament. God, that we get to hear the word of God and it transforms our very souls, Lord. Help all distractions be put aside. Help us to lean into your truth that we'd become more like your son, Jesus Christ, today. And all God's people say, 
You may be seated. So I'm gonna read a little story that I wrote. And if you didn't know, I write awesome novels. Not really, but listen to this. Mary and John have been married for 10 years. These are fake people. Mary is a God-fearing woman who works hard to please the Lord and her husband, John. Lately, she and John have had a hiccup in their marriage. They seem to be bickering and fighting lately like crazy. The finances have been tight, putting a strain on the relationship. In In an attempt to do all she can, Mary has been spending a ton of time with God. This Monday, she wakes up early, spends time with the Lord, prays, reads her word. She confessed to God her wrongdoing and is settled on the fact that she will have a good day. She slaves over the home all day, doing laundry, cooking food, and even taking special care to organize some of John's closet. She feels fantastic about herself and solid in the presence of God. Any women had this day so far? Anyone? Okay, a few of you are relating. All right. Fast forward eight hours later. John gets home from work. Dun, dun, dun. He walks in and you can feel the wrong attitude all over him. He's huffing and puffing about his job. He starts picking Mary apart about everything that she hasn't done in the house yet. I said not to leave my Diet Pepsi on the floor, put it in the fridge. Mary about loses it. She had done all she could that day to do everything well, but she was fed up. All the time she puts into this relationship and only for him to return, no favors and even try in the relationship. In the heat of this moment, she loses her temper and screams, you know what? You are a cotton-headed Nicky Muggins. I was gonna put a profanity in there, but I didn't want it, it's church. You can put in whatever you want right there. Mary is now discouraged and she's beat up. She cannot for the life of her know why John is such a problem. She thinks to herself, if he changes, then everything will be better. She thinks to herself, man, and I am such a failure as a Christian. I spend all this time with God, yet in a moment I lose my temper and use a profanity. I do everything wrong. What is wrong with us? Now, my question is, where is Mary's thinking wrong? And this is so common in all of us. Where is Mary's thinking wrong? So many of us go about life forgetting the actual war that we are in. While she is correct in thinking that John improving his actions may help, what she forgets is that her primary battle is not with flesh and blood, but spiritual forces behind every situation. Her actual battle is with the devil and his demons. Zechariah opens up, then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. This is a vision that Zechariah the prophet had. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Just like we read in Job a couple weeks ago, we are reminded of the battle that we are in. When life's trials come our way, it's won or lost in the mind. It's won or lost on what you stand and believe in. Zechariah speaks of Joshua, a person God chose for his own. The devil was there to accuse him. The fight against the nation of Israel and God's chosen people is not with the material circumstances or the things of the world. The war is with the enemy and it's over their mind and it's over their heart. In Mary and John's story, it's not just with John or it's not just with Mary. It's with the enemy who wants to destroy their minds, destroy their relationship with God. It is with the devil. The way you fight your spiritual battles will be significantly different if you understand that principle. Ephesians 6, 12, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness. Again, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That is the reality. When you sat and you thought of whatever your biggest battles are, do you understand that in that battle, the biggest fight is against spiritual forces? It's not the person you're thinking of. It's not the situation you're thinking of. It's not even the physical ailment that you're thinking of. Can I be honest? If you were afflicted with every single disease you can think of, you broke both your legs, you cut off both of your arms, if the devil didn't take your mind, would it even matter? If you still walked in complete fullness of joy in Christ's presence, would it even matter what he did to you? 
Now, this has stayed the same since the fall of man. God allowed evil in the world because God desired a world where love was a possibility. More than he desired a world where people didn't get to have their own will, where we didn't have an option. He wanted relationship. He is a relational, jealous God who wants people for himself, who worship him, who love him, and who love others. How does this make you look differently at the situations in your life? When there is strife between you and another brother or sister in Christ, who is the warfare really with? One, is you, one of you is giving in to the lie of the enemy. The enemy wants nothing more than for you to hate one another and to hate God. Anything he can do to separate you from enjoying the relationship and presence of God. Loving each other despite disagreement is far too sweet for the enemy. But it's the call for the Christian. Now, this makes you look at everything in culture differently. It makes you look at everything differently. Let me give you a few examples. So, when you're in a struggle, a relationship battle, you have strife with another person. Listen, when you know who the fight is actually with, with the enemy, you no longer need to avenge yourself. If someone's wrong, you guess what? I know this fight's with the devil. I know he wants my mind. I know he wants to steal my peace. I know that this person may be listening to the enemy. Listen, if they're an unbeliever, I promise you they're listening to the enemy. They're, walk, they're dead. They're dead spiritually. So many of us expect unbelievers to act righteousness when they are dead spiritually. You cannot have, you cannot have any expectations for an unbeliever. So listen, when they've wronged you, yeah, expect that. Have sorrow for their souls. Let God avenge you. You see how you look at that differently? Your battle is not with that person. Your battle is with the enemy. It means this, that you don't need to fix every, every problem. God can fix the problem. God won the victory over Satan. You are not stronger than Satan, but guess who is? Jebus. Jesus. That's his nickname I give him sometimes, I'm sorry. <laughs> There's this quote, sorry Kim, I know this is early, but I wanna talk about this. This is something important for all of us to understand. There is no neutrality in the world. There is no neutrality. Here's what C.S. Lewis says. There is no neutral ground in the universe. Every square inch, every split second is claimed by God or counterclaimed by Satan. Do you see that? What does that mean? Every, every argument, every fight, battle that you're in, every political issue, every social issue, everything is either claimed by God or claimed by Satan. Now, how does that then make you look at things like politics? People think there's neutral ground, like, oh, I can stand over here, that's not evil or it's not good. No, it's one or the other. Everything is either the righteousness of God and reflects his glory or it's Satan's. There is no such thing as neutrality. That's why we can confidently and boldly say that abortion is evil. There is no, well, let me play out 10 circumstances of what happened. This lady was raped in a corner, whatever. Abortion is evil. That is the enemy's territory because it's counter to the word of God. There is no neutral ground. And listen, I, I've, I've prayed about whether to say this. Maybe I shouldn't. You know, we met with the elders last night and we were talking about politics. And politics are tough because as a pastor, you don't ever want to push a candidate because there is no candidate that's Jesus. All of them are fallen men. But I, if I can tell you this, that we live in a day where the left progressive political agenda is literally run by Satan as dominion. It is flat out evil. And if I lose people from my church because of that, I'm not, I, I'm sorry. But when you get the foundation of scripture wrong, that God created man and woman to procreate, to take dominion. If you get the foundation wrong, wrong, our society crumbles. There is no neutral ground. Our society crumbles. 
If you cannot see the enemy at war saying men or women and women or men and, every, and everything's gay and every, it's, it's out of control. It is a war against God inten, God's intended order. So I'm not telling you who to vote for, but here's what I can tell you. That family is at the heart of how you should vote. We don't vote policies like individual policies. We vote trajectory. What is going to help the family succeed? I had about 10 claps there, and there's about 150 people here. So next week, if 10 of you show up, I know. <laughs> but there is no neutral ground. We have to understand our primary battles are with the enemy. And by the way, let me now push against all of you conservatives. Trump is not a prophet from God. I, I'm sorry that I offended you. In fact, he's an idiot half the time. Now, can God use idiots? Yes, he's using one right now. <laughs> but good Lord, don't be one of those weirdos that thinks he's like the savior of America. He's not. We might get him for four years. He's not going to save America. You know what's going to save America? The gospel. I just went on a total rant off my notes for like 10 minutes. All right. So listen, the accuser wants to separate you from God. He wants your heart, he wants your mind, he wants your affections. We do not wrestle with things of the world that was spiritual battles. So how do we win these battles? Listen, recently I was sent a video. Has anyone heard of the comedian Ed Bassmaster? Yeah, a couple of you? So he's kind of an uh, Instagram, social media co comedian. What he does, he dresses up as like this really weird guy and he walks around like this. Have you guys seen this? Well, recently, he walked up to this guy, and he's next to a garbage can. He's all like, he looks like a homeless guy. I think he's a homeless guy. Um, it looks really rough, just dirty. He's sitting by, I think he's dumpster diving. He's like picking, he walks up to him. He's like, hey, man, what's going on? Just starts talking to the guy. Well, anyway, he's, he's decked out in this weird disguise as a comedian. And he asked this guy, he said, hey, I want you to come with me tonight. And the guy's like, I'm not going to come with, why? He's like, just come with me tonight. I'm going to pay you. I'm going to put you in new clothes. I'm going to feed you an awesome meal. And I want you to get on stage with me tonight at my comedy show. The guy's like, all right. So for the rest of the video, he takes him back to a hotel. He, he strips him down. He puts new clothes on him. He showers him up. He feeds him. And in the middle of this, Ed puts on a bunch of different like disguises and comes in about every 30 minutes as a different character and completely like the guy falls for all of it. But what's beautiful about the story and the point of it is you watch this guy who is, by the world's standards, the lowest, the unloved, the dirty, the sinner, you watch the joy come out of him. You watch a man completely transform because somebody has poured undeserving love on him. Now, the story that we read this week in Zechariah is the same thing. The story that we read in Zechariah this week is our story. By the way, the cool part of that story is that Ed Bassmaster clip is actually a guy local to the Quad Cities who now goes to a church locally. So, super cool story. But anyway, listen, listen to this uh, scripture. So, verses four and five. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was standing before the angel clothed with filthy garments. And the angel said to those standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, behold, I have taken your iniquity away from you. And I will clothe you with pure vestments. Let them put a clean turban on his head so that they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with garments. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Listen, Joshua was in filthy garments. Joshua was far from perfect. Joshua accused, is accused of being dirty, a fake, a fraud, a sinner to God by the enemy. Yet God looks at him and says, I rebuke you, Satan. I have chosen him. Not because he's perfect, not because he's righteous, but because I've made him clean. And I love him. Because I am God and he's mine. Listen, love is measured by the gap between the lover and the beloved. Love is measured by the gap between the lover and the beloved. 
when you understand the gospel, this is how you fight battles against the enemy. This is how you win battles. When you understand that you are like Joshua in dirty clothes, that you're a mess, that you are a vile sinner that falls short frequently, yet he has made you righteous. He has taken those dirty clothes off of you and clothed you in beautiful garments. When you fight from that place, you get victory. The gap between the lover and the beloved. I know when I see people in my church that aren't following the ways of God, that aren't doing things for God, that still wrestle constantly with the enemy, when they're constantly beat up, I most assuredly know that they do not understand this message. The gospel is how we follow the law. The gospel is how we defeat the enemy. You cannot do it on your own, good luck. If you wanna throw gloves on and go to battle with the devil, he's gonna beat you up every single time. But if you fight from a place from the gospel, from that he's already been victorious, that he's already made you righteous, that he's chosen you and you rest and let him fight your battles, you win every time. So again, think of what I asked you earlier. What are your biggest struggle? Are you trying to solve it on your own? Are you trying to figure out every single right move that you can make and do everything perfectly so that hopefully you can win this battle? Or are you remembering that he's clothed you, he's called you his child, He's fighting these battles for you. You know what he's asking from you? Trust. He's asking peace. He's asking for you to relax. He's got it. Once you realize that despite your dirty garments, once you know that he has taken those dirty clothes and put you in fresh ones, once you know he rebukes the accuser when he pops his head in, then you begin to do great things for God. Then you begin to walk in his ways. I love the Old Testament stories that show the consistency in the character of God. From the Old Testament to the New Testament, there is an order in this story that is super important. It's the same order today. It is the key to walking in the ways of God. It is the key to success in the Christian life in finding more peace, fulfillment, joy in Christ. It is the key to every spiritual warfare. I'm gonna read it again. And the angel said to those standing before him, remove the filthy garments from him. And he said to him, behold, I have taken your iniquity from you and I will clothe you with pure vestments. I said to him, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him. And the angel of the Lord solemnly assured Joshua, Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right access among those who are standing here. Notice the order of the story. God comes in, sees Joshua in dirty clothes. He doesn't say, hey, in your dirty clothes, go out and follow my commands. What's he do first? He says, devil, you're a liar. I rebuke you. I've made him righteous. I've clothed him in new clothes. So he's in right standing with God. Now go out and follow my ways. That order is the order of the gospel. It is the order and the key to spiritual victory. We get that order backwards all the time. We think the key to our spiritual victory is you doing everything right. No, it's believing right. It's remembering you stand clean. You stand righteous. I may, you may go home right now and get in a fight with your husband or wife and you may sin. But guess what you, what you can do? Father, I recognize that. I sinned. You forgive me. I'm righteous before you. And now I keep walking. You fight from victory. What battle did you think of earlier? Fight from victory. Trust God. Have faith in God. It's not the fear, listen, it's not the fear of God's wrath that drives a person to repentance, that drives a person to change. Now, as a believer, listen, don't hear me. There is fear of wrath. He pours his wrath out against all unrighteousness. I want nothing to do with his wrath, neither should you. But you know what really melts hearts? Is the fact that he looks at you in your mess and says, I still choose, chose you. 
He looks at you despite any sin you've ever committed or will commit and says, you're mine. When you grasp the depth of that, it changes everything about who you are and everything about what you do. You know, Colin DeBizer, anyone know Colin? Colin, raise your hand, I embarrass you. So Colin at KC a couple weeks ago, there's this paradox in Christianity. We had this conversation, you know, Christianity is a paradox because while we are telling you to go be great, we are also telling you to rest. While we are telling you to follow the law, we are also telling you that you've died to the law. <laughs> it can be confusing, but I want you to understand and I want you to get this because it is a paradox. The key is this. You follow the law and the ways of God from the posture of the gospel, from a place of being forgiven, from a place of being clothed in new garments, from a place that God has wiped out your sins and failures once and for all, from a place of he loves you despite anything you've done or will do, if you grasp that, that is where your victory is. The message, if you guys notice, it's like I say the same thing every week. I probably will say the same thing because if you think you understand the depth of this message, you don't. It's a sure sign that you don't. We will never get to the bottom of the vast ocean that is God's love for us. I will continue to struggle to communicate it to you week after week because when a person grasps that, all of a sudden you have people like Matt Coyle delivered from drug addiction for 17 years. It's the gap between the lover and the beloved. Do you see yourself as Joshua in dirty garments and that you've been clothed in righteousness? That's the key to your spiritual victory. That's the key to everything in this life. That's how we change a city. That's how we change a nation. Teenagers, young kids, are you in here? Are there teens in here? Listen to me, two teens. Three teens, listen to me. Are you looking at me? <laughs> your entire life, your fight is not with your parents. Your fight is not with your boyfriend and girlfriend. Your fight is not with your teachers. Your fight the rest of your life is with the enemy. And you have to grasp that. Your mom and dad are not the problem. <laughs> Your bad grades are not the problem. Your boredom is not the problem. Your problem is you are in a fight, a spiritual fight with the enemy that wants your heart, that wants your loves. And you, we've, if you remember that now, I wish I knew that as a kid because I thought all the problems were out there with all of them, with that. It's not, our fight is with the enemy. The order of our thinking matters. Are you firstly and rightly remembering that the battle has been ultimately won? You are God's. You are righteous. You are walking in new digs. That's close if you're over 40. <laughs> love you guys. Do you remember his great love that he has for you? Your enemy has been defeated. But do you live that way? Do you live in a way of knowing the enemy has been defeated or are your circumstances beating you up? Are you beat down? Live from victory. Listen, the devil can have all that. He can have all the circumstantial stuff. That's not what we live for anyway. We live for Jesus. He's the greatest prize and guess what? You have him. You have him, but do you treasure him as the greatest prize? Stand up with me. Imagine if the devil could never take your mind or your heart. Imagine that no matter your circumstance, there was an unexplainable peace in you. Imagine that you trusted that Christ had won your battles and that you were clothed in new clothing like Zechariah. We can't be like the Nazis and focus our attention on the wrong enemy. We have to see the bigger picture. We have to know that behind every situation, we are to fight with the devil. And I love this verse, and I'm gonna leave you with this verse. This is the posture of a Christian. Do not be anxious about anything. Did it say, do not be anxious about some things? Do not be anxious about, this is like kids church. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, 
by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Let me pray for you guys. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you guard our hearts. We thank you that you've already won the battle, that you've seen the dirty clothes, you've taken them off, you've put us in new garments, you've made us righteous, you've called us yours. The creator of all things, the creator of the devil. You control it all. We have nothing to fear. He's doing nothing else but training our minds to worship the creator God, to love you above all things, to be in relationship with him above all things, to treasure Jesus above all things. God, teach us and mold us and shape us. Thank you for the